A very good morning to you, and you're very welcome to today's signpost webinar. I hope you're keeping safe and well. So this series is brought to you by Chagas in collaboration with Dairy Sustainability Ireland, the National Rural Network, and Food Drink Ireland Skillnet. So let's remind ourselves why we are here today. Since the 1800s, the world has warmed by 1.1 degrees, and each of the last four decades has been warmer than any decade since 1850. In its latest report, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, has stated that it is now an established fact that human-caused greenhouse gas emissions have led to an increased frequency and or intensity of some weather and climate extremes since pre-industrial times. And this can explain some of the more unusual weather events that we have been experiencing in Ireland in recent times. So today we're going to talk about how farmers can reduce their greenhouse emissions, uh, gas emissions, and save money at a time when particularly in a landscape where, where fertilizer prices are, are an all time high. And we're delighted to be joined by Dr. Patrick Forrestal, who's a researcher in Johnstown Castle. Good morning, Patrick, how are you today? Good morning, good morning, Mark, and good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining in today. And we're also joined by Pat Murphy, uh, who's head of the KT Environment Programme. Good morning, Pat. How are you today? Good morning. Great. Not a bother. Uh, so, Patrick, maybe you could tell us about the work that you're doing in Johnstown Castle before we get into the presentation. Yeah, very good. Look, and uh, thanks for the invite to, to come and, and speak uh, today at, at Johnstown Castle and myself and uh, the other colleagues there at the research center, a lot of the work that we're doing is looking at how do we sustain production and productivity of our systems, uh, but find the winds that could be there to deliver solutions for reduced emissions, be those greenhouse gas emissions, ammonia emissions, or reduced loss of nutrients to water, um, oil, um, and, and I suppose to try and come up with those practical solutions that farmers can implement uh, to try and make those reductions um, and look, we also do work um, to figure out just how, what level of emissions are coming from different fertilizers or different options. And that goes into feed and refine um, inventories around those emissions. So in some of the work we've done in the past, we found actually the emissions coming from certain um, inputs like dung and urine, for instance, were lower than, than was assumed. So there were savings to be made there. So that's one example of work that we do in that space but I suppose also we're looking for um, you know can we achieve the same end result in terms of production with a lower emission footprint and, uh, um, or, and lower absolute emissions and I'll speak a little bit about some of those opportunities today. Great okay super so you're going to give us some maybe some of the, the practical advice but also some of the science behind that so if you could share, share your screen with us and just to remind everybody if you're new to the webinar, you can submit your questions to us using the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen. And today's webinar will be recorded and available on the Chagas YouTube channel, along with Patrick's presentation. And if you want to tune in on a podcast, you can do that. Just search Signpost Webinar and it'll pop up on whichever signpost or podcast platform that you use. So uh, Patrick, we'll hand over to you and we will chat to you after the presentation. Very good. Uh, thank you, Mark. Um, look, good to have everyone on here this morning and look, we'll, we'll talk through, I suppose, some issues that are quite topical at the moment. I think the, the price of fertilizer is at the forefront of everyone's mind as we come into that fertilizer spreading season. Um, and in today's presentation, I'll talk about some tips based on the research that we've been doing recently that could play a role in helping save you money and also reducing emissions on your farm. So I suppose technologies or options or things that you can do that, that, that can help to save some money, but also have that win on the climate side of things or the emission side of things. And I suppose it's important for us to recognize that those emissions and the water quality, et cetera, those things are being measured and they do feed back and um, the progress that we made do feed back into, I suppose, the, the overall context of, of how we're going to be farming uh, going going into the future. So it's good to keep that in mind. So look at the first, um, the first thing I want to say is that the knowledge that you have of your own farm, that knowledge is very, very powerful. The soils of Ireland, they're very diverse. As you can see here from uh, some pictures of various soils, 
that I've been in, involved in doing trial work or management on. Um, and this is just a, a fraction of those soils. So the, the soils, um, the aspect of those soils, the exposure that they have, the drainage of them, these type of factors all affect things like how fast will they warm up in the spring, which you know, has implications in terms of putting out nitrogen and what sort of fields or areas might it be more of a gamble um, in terms of response uh, versus others and how they're going to lock up phosphorus, what, how buffered they are in terms of how much lime it's going to take to adjust their pH. You know, maybe they're peat soils and they need some uh, different management than mineral soils. So these type of factors, you know these better than anyone and certainly better than I uh, for your farm. So I suppose what we want to add to this is a layer of tips that you could implement on your farm and to sort of build on that knowledge that you already have. And of course, soil sampling and having a soil test is one of those key uh, aspects, um, which has been, I suppose, much, much talked about, um, but is a very powerful tool. Now look at nitrogen prices are very high. Um, last year, Irish agriculture used something in the order of around 400,000 tons of nitrogen nutrient. Um, so that's not of product, that would be many more tons, but of nitrogen nutrient closing in on 400,000 tons. In very broad terms, that cost around 400 million euros to farmers. Now with fertilizer prices being, you know, two and a half or three times higher, and if they're sustained through the year, we use a, a similar amount of nitrogen, that's going to cost more than a billion euro. So this is a huge, um, this is a huge additional cost uh, to the agriculture industry. And I suppose there's not much getting away from the fact that we do have this opportunity um, to if you like, grow our own nitrogen by use of legumes. Um, and by introducing those, reduce or wean off to some extent our reliance on mineral imported fertilizer nitrogen, which is generally imported from either outside of Europe or made within Europe, often relying on natural gas um, that's imported into Europe. Um, and I suppose that, that presents a little bit of a risk to our system just in terms of getting access to it and, and that cost fluctuation, which I suppose has been particularly pronounced um, in the present year. So look at, in terms of bringing clover into swards, there's some really nice work and guidance there that's been done and developed by colleagues, including James Humphreys and Deirdre Hennessy and Brian McCarty and, and, and Mike Egan, just in terms of getting that uh, into the sward there. But I suppose one thing I wanted to bring to that also from a pH trial that we've been running at Johnstown Castle, where you see here there's pH in this replicated setup running from the mid pH 5 up to close to pH um, 6, 6.8 in this case, but close to 7. So this was a sward, a grass sward receiving 150 kilograms of N per hectare, where we overseeded clover um, in 2020. Um, and this was the impact of pH on the grass yield of that overseeded sward in 2021. So you can see a very marked effect of soil pH on the success of the clover in that, in that sward in terms of um, benefiting, benefiting, benefiting yield. So look at in the coming year, many of you may be thinking about clover, introducing it either by stitching it in or um, or reseeding, including clover. And I know with clover, there is additional management there, but if you think about it in, ter in, in terms of the current prices, like if you can realize a 75 kilogram per hectare saving in nitrogen, that's close to 10,000 euros on a 50 hectare farm. And of course, you're less reliant on fertilizer nitrogen and there's less um, greenhouse gas emissions associated with that. Um, and that would also be reflected in our nitrogen in, in the overall inventory of emissions. So we, we get a benefit there. So really the tip that I have for you this morning is, look, I know that clover is not an overnight, you're not gonna get it into the sward overnight, but on many farms, there may be some clover that's you know ticking away there in swards. You can give that clover a boost for the coming year with lime where your pH um, is lower in those mineral soils. Um, and Many people are thinking of pulling their nitrogen rate back slightly, um, or maybe more than slightly, and that reduction in nitrogen will also um, 
will also help the clover. So those are two things that will help the clover in sport where it exists already. And if you're thinking of establishing clover by whatever means, really your first step is to lift the pH. You're not setting yourself up for success for that investment to try and do that if you don't lift uh, the pH first. Really, you're talking about getting up into the mid sixes, that sort of level is, is a better place to be than, let's say, certainly if you're below six, um, you know, you're, you're not in a good place to, to start um, trying to add, add clover in the mineral soils. So that leads us to the question of, look, do you know the pH of each field on your farm at present? And, you know, the soil testing point that's been mentioned, I suppose you, you've heard again and again, but in this particular year, it's particularly important. So if the answer is no, you don't know offhand, um, well, one thing you could do is you could dig out the last soil samples and, and see what they said. That would give you some sort of, of a guide. Um, just in terms of where you are. If you haven't added lime, likelihood is that the pH has declined um, and prioritize soil, soil sampling. I know it's a busy time on farms uh, with calving, et cetera, but if you have the chance to prioritize soil sampling, get that information, um, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's really a year where that investment is worthwhile and um, more so than, um, or, or certainly ex, ex, it, to an extra level than, than it, it usually is. Um, you know, based on that information, you can spread lime as required. We're coming into a time of the year where people are say maybe hesitating about um, spreading lime because right they've got slurry that they want to spread and what about issues there? Look, if you wait seven to ten days after slurry application for your lime application, you should be okay. There's not a, an issue there. It's not ideal before slurry, and that's why there's guidance there to wait a number of months. Um, after lime application before applying slurry. But I suppose the nuance that I would add to that is if you're using the low emission spreaders and you've got dull, dull, cool uh, conditions, um, that level of loss would be minimized in comparison to if you're going out with a splash plate on a windy, uh, on a windy bright day. So, you know, there are things that you can do there by just using your own management at your own site, given the weather conditions and the equipment that you're using, that, that could uh, squeeze that window. And getting lime on is really important um, for the clover. Also, I suppose a question comes up around, what about lime with protected urea? I'm thinking of using protected urea this year, and I'm hesitant to lime. Um, I did some preliminary uh, work um, in Johnstown Castle, uh, where I applied um, protected urea onto these um, plates straight onto lime and the protected urea didn't seem to have increased um, emissions of ammonia or loss of nitrogen uh, where it was applied to those lime soils. So that seems to be um, seems to be okay. So I suppose the message is get the lime on. And that lime is, I suppose, relatively good value in that it's its price hasn't uh, hasn't moved. To, certainly to the extent that the fertilizer prices have moved. And, you know, even with the fertilizer prices going up and nitrogen particularly jumping up, phosphorus is still the most expensive nutrient uh, to purchase. Um, and what, what we see here is, is um, another, another trial um, from Johnstown Castle where we have a range of uh, replicated pHs uh, from five all the way up to 6.6. .6. And you can see here on this, um, as we increase pH, the Morgan soil test value, which is indicating the available phosphorus, um, is increasing, and particularly when we get into above pH 6. So that available P that's there is being released um, by adding lime. And look, for this particular soil type, we're seeing it, and this is an agreement would work um, on other soil types. So this seems to be a, a quite a universal effect. This is a quite a universal chemically driven um, effect across a range of soils. So the tip that I, I would bring to you around phosphorus is look, fertilizer is expensive. Why not try and unlock as much of the phosphorus that you already have with lime and so try and supply more of your phosphorus requirement to the, to the plant using, using lime. And I suppose just to put some, some figures on this, um, about six kilograms of phosphorus or 12 units of phosphorus, that's about all, you, all the phosphorus you're going to get for the price of a ton of lime in or around that. 
So look, uh, line is a good value fertilizer. And on the emissions team, this is some work just off the presses in 2021. And the team in Johnstown looked at, is there emission saving from increasing the pH up to the optimum level or a little beyond it? Um, and we can see in this paper, the relationship between uh, soil pH here along the um, horizontal axis and cumulative nitrous oxide emissions. So nitrous oxide being a very potent greenhouse gas. And we see that declining trend in cumulative nitrous oxide emissions as um, the soil pH increases. So um, correcting your soil pH, uh, bringing it up into an optimum range, that can also play a role in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So there's a win there. Um, and that, that's a, a reduction, even considering that there is some greenhouse gas emission associated with the CO2 release um, when, when we spread lime. Um, however, because nitrous oxide is such a potent greenhouse gas, um, that, that there's a benefit there. Now look at, we all know that nitrogen fertilizer prices are, are high, as are, are they for uh, fertilizers generally, and I'm sure a lot of you are reeling from the, the quotes you've gotten from fertilizer for the coming year. Um, and I want to bring in to the conversation um, some work that we've been doing as part of two EU funded projects, uh, Renew to Farm and Nutri to Cycle, where we've been looking at, I suppose, what's going, going to become a more important area in, in the coming decade and beyond, where there's more of a focus on recycling waste streams and bringing them back into agriculture as nutrient sources. So instead of the system where we um, you know, purchase mineral fertilizer that's been mined or, um, or, or broken out of the air in the case of nitrogen, um, and then the food is produced and uh, those nutrients are lost in waste streams, that that is recaptured. And that's particularly important for us uh, for phosphorus and as we're seeing now for nitrogen um, in Europe, because we depend on importing phosphorus in particular uh, from outside of Europe. Um, and these bio-based fertilizers, as they're referred to, um, can recapture these nutrients and put them in. So look, at, we, we've been doing some work on these. If you haven't heard of them before, that's, that's, that's good. I suppose I want to share, um, share a little bit about this developing area, if you like. So we, we looked at um, the performance of this uh, struvite. So really, if you've got any phosphorus rich wa wastewater stream, they can precipitate out the phosphorus into this struvite material. Here it is typically six to 8% P, um, sometimes higher, um, but that's kind of what we were, we were working with um, in this particular study. Ash material, so this could be, in this case, combusted sewage sludge or poultry litter ash, these are different nutrients. And, and of course, the dairy processing sludges, um, and there's a large amount of these being generated um, as a byproduct of our dairy uh, processing industry here in Ireland. Um, a number of years ago, a colleague estimated this to be in the region of 140,000 tonnes of material uh, uh, nationally, and it's likely that that has increased. So look, we looked at two dairy processing sludges, one calcium precipitated, precipitated and one um, aluminium precipitated dairy sludge. So look at these may be nutrient sources that are available um, close by to you. And you know, many farmers are already using them or a good number of farmers are. And, and of course you've got cattle slurry, um, uh, a resource that you've got on the farm itself, if you can't. And if you like, in a sense, that's a bio-based fertilizer that, that you're managing. And I think we've got scope to do better um, with slurry, um, which is an opportunity there for us. And in additionally, it can bring some extra things to the party as we'll, we'll talk about here shortly. So look, I suppose a tip is have a look around locally, see what, what might be available to you in terms of these bio-based or recycled fertilizers and making the best use of slurry is also an opportunity that we'll talk a little bit more of. So look, at one of the things we wanted to do with these materials was like, right, they're not the same as conventional mineral fertilizers. So how available are the nutrients in them? We've previously looked at the dairy processing sludges. They do contain some nitrogen as well, but typically that nitrogen was not as available as mineral nitrogen um, in the range 20 to 40% availability comparing to calcium ammonium nitrate. Uh, so a nitrogen source, but not such a, not, not, not um, available to the extent, same extent. So what about on the, on the phosphorus side? Uh, we put these out in a field trial that ran for actually three years with a single application of 
phosphorus at the beginning. And subsequently, we cut them and applied, we, we took off silage cuts without any P, but we put on nitrogen, potassium, and sulfur to make sure that those weren't limited, essentially to draw down that phosphorus and see how much of it could we get back into the plant. So if we looked at the superphosphate as, as if you like our mineral fertilizer base comparison, up here you're looking at a parent P recovery. So this is the recovery of phosphorus that was applied minus off what the control or background supplied. This was an index one soil, so it needed phosphorus. And if we look at the very first harvest, so that big uh, first cut silage, um, how much of the P that we applied did we get back into the plant? It was about 10% apparent P recovery for the super P for that first harvest. So, so I suppose this drives home also that when you apply a readily available phosphorus source to soils, um, there's a competition there for lockup of that phosphorus. And that's why going back to liming is so important to keep it available. So it's not getting locked up in the soil at those lower pH levels. But look, I suppose generally what we see is that um, the cattle, a cattle slurry and super P combination, which say you might apply where you bring um, cattle slurry to an out block, but you're not getting the full rate on. So you're applying some super P that was pretty much as available. These struvites were looking good. Um, they got more into the plant. However, the ash and the dairy sludge didn't seem to be quite as readily available. But that wasn't the end of the story. We, we looked at the full first year of cuts. Here, the Super P got up to 15% recovery and um, matched by the cattle slurry combination. The struvites again looked good. And if we go over to the dairy sludges, we see quite a contrast here. The aluminium uh, precipitated activated dairy sludge, that was just as good as the super P for supplying phosphorus over the course of the first year, uh, whereas the lime treated dairy sludge was not. And you might say, well, maybe that lime treated dairy sludge isn't, isn't as good. Um, and it doesn't seem to be supplying the P as readily in the first year, but we're also interested in how can these supply P over time? So if when we bring in the second year data, this is interesting because that lime treated dairy sludge has now supplied as much phosphorus to the plant as did that application of super P fertilizer. And here, the cattle slurry combination with super P is moving ahead of the super P only. And I suppose this, this just points to one of the benefits that's there of getting some cattle slurry out on ground that maybe is far away, maybe you're managing with just bagged fertilizer, getting some cattle slurry to it can improve um, the amount of P that you're getting into the plant. Um, the dairy sludges uh, had a difference. Um, and we went on a third year. And again, here we see quite marked differences um, with the cattle slurry benefit really, really coming in there versus the super P. And you know, these dairy sludges over a longer trajectory um, doing at least as well, if not better than the super P. So I suppose the, the message from this trial is, is really that you know, there are opportunities there with, with, with slurry and for these bio-based fertilizers as we go over time. Now, one of the other elements that we work on in Johnstown Castle and try, and, and try to integrate into the work that we're doing is looking at the soil biological health. Um, we looked at the earthworm biomass in a sister set of these plots, which were essentially demo plots where we integrated these fertilizers into a fertilizer program such that they were applied with every split. So not just once up front, uh, which, is, sorry, which is the typical approach to look at the pea recovery, but integrating them as a farmer would. And what we see here is that comparing to the mineral fertilizer NPKS only, so that's your bagged fertilizer, using cattle slurry as part of that fertilizer program increased the earthworm biomass number. And um, so it was actually double and these bio-based fertilizers also seem to um, be beneficial. So look at, I suppose that's the tip there. Inter bring in cattle slurry or these bio-based fertilizers has potential um, to be beneficial um, compared to just using mineral fertilizer. So on the, on the I suppose, the point of slurry, um, we really have a chance to up our game with our, our, our slurry management. Um, and driven, I suppose, by the savings that we can make uh, by doing so. Um, I think it was in 2018, based on looking at this nice work, survey work of, of, of Trish Berry, 
um, from 2013, where she looked at a whole range of slurries, and she found that there was a massive variation in the NP and K content of slurries that are out there. And William Burchill has recently uh, done an update to that work um, on, on the uh, Dairy Gold uh, Chagas Joint Program Farms, and again, seeing that massive variation. And uh, William and I wrote an article in Today's Farm, the Chagas Today's Farm magazine uh, from January, and um, that work from William is reported in there. But really the point, the main point is that, look, we, we take in fertilizer, bagged fertilizer, it has a nutrient label on it. I don't think we'd accept it without a nutrient label. Yet we have all this resource of slurry and we only have, I suppose, a coarse estimation of what nutrients are in it. If you use the book values that are there, that's better than using no information. But if we want to up our game, testing the slurry and getting a nutrient value um, is, uh, is a tip that can be, uh, that I think can help us to improve our, our, our game with slurry and realize some savings then on the fertilizer side as a result of that. And look, it, it is a, a, an extra thing to do and it is an investment of maybe 60 to 90 euros. But look at it with the current fertilizer prices, you wouldn't get a lot of fertilizer for, for 60 or 90 euros as we, as we know. Look, and I suppose there's those long-standing tips there also around soil testing, so you know where are the fields to target that slurry to. Often the silage ground has a big demand for K, you're pulling off a lot of K, and you can see here in those slurry samples, even whether you're at the low end or, or the high end or the average, it's potassium that is the nutrient that's in greatest abundance in slurry. So getting that back to the K demanding area is, um, is important. And look, I suppose with the low emission spreading, there's a chance to spread on, on grazing paddocks without contaminating grass, which is an opportunity, but just watch out for the K side of things and look at your soil test. If you've got soils that are, that are grazing pastures that are high in K and you're adding a high K fertilizer, which is what slurry is to it, you might run into issues with grass tetany or leave yourself short um, on K for your silage ground, which you then have to uh, purchase as, as fertilizer. And as we've talked about already, there's that kind of, there's that additional benefit um, of, of the P availability when you combine um, or use, um, when you use the slurry to deliver P. Um, just to, to touch, touch briefly on this picture that you see up here in the top right, um, that again, from work that William Burchill did at Johnstone Castle, William found that where you got the slurry rapidly into tanks, so it wasn't sitting around on collecting yards that retained more of the nitrogen in the slurry. So there's more nitrogen there to start off with. And it's not, if you like, blowing away as it's sitting around on the, um, on, on the concrete. So if you can get your tanks, if you can get slurry off collecting yards and into tanks, and um, that holds more of the nitrogen there in your slurry store. So look, getting the nutrient label will help us to meet the challenge of getting the correct nutrient rate on each field in each crop. Um, and knowing that base amount of what you put out in slurry. So you need to know the rate that you're applying it at, and then that label will help you to get a better number on what you've applied, which working with your advisor or your technical sales agronomist, you can uh, fine tune the NPK requirements uh, for fertilizer. And really this year is a year for prescriptions for each field um, with the cost of fertilizer. And how well you do that is really going to define how, where you sit on that podium of performance, if you like, uh, for, for production and also for cost savings. Look, um, it's been said many times at this point, but using the low emissions uh, spreading um, technology, the nitrogen that you're going to save this year using those spreaders is more valuable than it ever was. Um, if you took the example here, um, going from, and bearing in mind what I said about the variability, but this, these rough uh, kind of average rules of thumb, if you move from summer using a splash plate to spring using a low emissions um, trail and shoe or dribble bar, you're gonna save about six units. And to put it in money terms, for a two and a half thousand gallon tanker going to the field, that's about 20 euros extra, just by making, making that change for every tanker. And uh, so, that, so that adds up as you spread a tank. So the tip is, Use the low emission spreading because it 
retains that nitrogen. It's helping us on the emissions front, but it's also nitrogen that's retained to grow grass on your farm. And that gives an opportunity to adjust downward the bag nitrogen um, to account for that extra saved nitrogen. And you should do that. Now look at, I suppose, on the nitrogen theme, uh, we've seen with the protected urea work that the form of nitrogen can impact um, the emissions while allowing us to sustain the same level of yield. But one question that has been coming up is, well, look, if I don't have nitrate there, will I have a yield penalty? So if I have more of an ammonium form or urea, which is an ammonium forming fertilizer, protected urea is an ammonium forming fertilizer, um, would it have a yield penalty? So this is work that we just published um, in the last few months where we looked at a grass war that was fertilized with uh, just a nitrate fertilizer. So only nitrate, all the nitrogen delivered as nitrate versus only ammonium, all the nitrogen delivered as ammonium in the fertilizer. And there was no yield difference, no difference in, in nitrogen uptake and no difference in nitrogen use efficiency between these two sources. We also measured emissions of nitrous oxide uh, from both of these treatments. So they had the same level of production, but the nitrous oxide emission factor for the nitrate um, was almost three times higher than that of ammonium. So look, the form of nitrogen that we, we choose makes, makes a difference. And this has implications for the compounds. Some compounds, the, the weighting is more towards ammonium than nitrate. And there's a the Department of Agriculture have funded a new project that's going to look into that in more detail, and um, which will be starting soon. I suppose that brings me on to protected urea. Um, many of you might be very familiar with it um, and maybe some others not so much. So just very briefly, um, protected urea, it's standard urea that's protected from ammonia loss using something called a urease inhibitor. And that simply blocks the ure urease enzyme. It's not, um, it's not killing off the bacteria, for instance, it's just blocking the enzyme. It's fooling the enzyme into thinking it met urea, but it's actually met the inhibitor. And essentially, like slurry, ordinary urea loses ammonia, and that's loss of nitrogen that you paid for. And if you think about, about the around about 40,000 tons of nutrient urea bought last year, uh, that's losing, according to the EPA, around 15.5% on average. Now that varies um, depending on the weather conditions, but on average, that's the average value used. And using today's prices, that was about 11 million euros worth of nitrogen that blew away and also counted against us for emissions. The protected urea brings that loss down to around 3%, 3.3% roughly. Um, so that differential there in ammonia that would have otherwise blown away, but was saved and instead put, um, gives an opportunity to cut the protected urea rate by about 12% versus standard urea, while delivering to the plant about the same amount of effective nitrogen. So, while protected urea might look a little bit more expensive per ton, and um, granted all fertilizer is very expensive at the moment, um, with the potential to cut the rate, it's actually better value than, than standard urea. So think about protected urea like low emission spreading for urea. It's very effective, but you don't need that equipment. You just, I suppose you, you pay the premium for it and you put it in your spreader and away you go. Um, now, I suppose that saving around ammonia in the shorter term trials that, that we've done uh, in, in cutting in Johnson Castle and at other sites and Brian McCarthy and Anya Murray have done some nice work in grazing showing that the, all the fertilizers stacked up in terms of yield. But the question I suppose keeps coming up, what about what, if we're saving this nitrogen from ammonia loss, why are we not seeing it in yield? And um, back uh, a number of years ago, I set up this long-term experiment in Johnstown Castle where we repeatedly applied the same fertilizers to the same plots over time. So here's a seven year data set um, where, we, where we compare um, urea, can and protected urea. Um, so everything is expressed relative to urea, this 100% line here. Um, and if we bring in the can performance over those seven years here, we see that in five out of seven years, can is above, um, is above the urea line in terms of its uh, relative yield or yield relative to protected to ordinary urea. So bringing in the protected urea, we see that in six out of seven years, it's above that urea line. And it, it's 2018 that we see them 
let's say, fall below the, the level of standard urea. But I wouldn't read too much into that in the sense that in 2018, it was water that was the limiter here. None of these plots were limited for nitrogen. They all had enough nitrogen. Um, simply water was the limitation. Um, so how much extra did they grow? Well, the fertilizer didn't grow all of this yield as it doesn't on your farms also. The background grew um, a portion of the nitrogen. So it's really this, this difference here that the fertilizer actually grew. So if we look at that, um, that additional yield over this long-term experiment with repeated application um, and exclude that drought here can give us an additional 9% over urea and protected urea an extra 13% over standard urea. So look at what we're seeing is the protected urea. It does stack up for the farmer in terms of yield, uh, certainly in cost, which I'll have a slide on a little bit later. And it gives us that emission reduction um, that can go straight into the inventory. Now, one, one of the many questions that has come up around protected urea is, would it be a soil health effect of using protected urea? Um, and look, unfortunately, we have these long-term plots and our soil microbiologist, Fiona Brennan, uh, along with her colleague, Aoife Duff, have actually taken soil from these long-term plots and looked at the soil microbial community in a very extensive way, but essentially no effect of the urease inhibitor on the microbial community composition or diversity is what they found. And there's a paper currently in review on that that will be published here in due course. I suppose another tip that we have from some uh, work that uh, my PhD student, Claire Aspel, has uh, published in the last uh, month or so, this is looking at sulfur and its potential uh, benefit um, in, in swords. So in this experimental setup, you can see uh, plus sulfur and without sulfur, and visually you can see a difference there. Uh, this was an experiment conducted in a uh, a soil that was quite responsive to, very responsive to, to uh, sulfur. It was a light textured sandy loam soil that was free draining. And some tips from that paper that's been recently published. Claire saw up to 2.9 tons of additional dry matter uh, with the use of sulfur on this particular free draining sandy loam soil. Now it's important to say that not all soils will respond to this level. And that brings me back to the first slide that I showed you, your knowledge of your own farm really trumps, a lot, trumps uh, this type of information. This is giving you a guide, but you can really fine tune it by that knowledge you have of your own farm. But that was the magnitude of benefit that she was seeing. Importantly with this challenge also, not only in atmospheric emissions, but in losses to water and water quality, Claire saw that inclusion of uh, sulfur um, reduced nitrate leaching by 46%. And importantly, kept the nitrate leaching levels coming out of this soil below that drinking water standard. Um, whereas where sulfur wasn't included, there was levels of up to 40 milligrams per kilogram coming out. So this is a, a potential uh, solution or and, and can help with water quality in, in areas that, that are, are struggling um, with water quality issues. You might be thinking, look, I'm applying slurry, that's covering me off for sulfur. I don't have to worry too much about it. Slurry is not a great source of sulfur. Uh, quite a bit of the sulfur that's in the manure has, has volatilized off uh, during the storage. And in addition, the slurry, the sulfur that's there remaining, um, Claire found only about 9% of it was available. Um, so just bear this in mind when you're thinking about um, um, sulfur, sulfur applications and getting in a few rounds uh, during the season or making sure that it's adequately taken care of uh, for your silage ground. Um, if two here, minutes, Patrick. Okay, so we're, 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 coming, we're coming towards the end anyway. So look, hopefully you're, you're, you're hanging in there with me anyway. Um, Claire has uh, some work coming down, the uh, coming, that'll be coming on stream hopefully before too long and um, where she looked at response to sulfur across a range of soils. So a different sandy loam soil here, giving three tons extra, so these, lighter textured soils can be quite responsive to sulfur. So that if this is you and you have these type of soils, make sure you're taking care of sulfur and you're getting several rounds of sulfur into your uh, fertilizer uh, program for your, for your grazing and definitely for your silage. Um, 
other soils giving less of a response. And we have seen also soils that don't give any response. So you're going to be somewhere um, in that level. So think about what can you do on your own farm, particularly in this high price year. Is it worth your while to get a sulfur fertilizer and spread a stripe of it down the middle of a paddock? Um, you know, maybe spread it, spread out nitrogen and, and skip something in the middle and have a sulfur fertilizer there in the yard next, put it into the spreader and spread a stripe of that down through, through the paddock and it's there in the spreader for the next go round. Um, and you can have a look on your farm and see what kind of benefit you're getting from it. Uh, doing that in the April, May time is, is a particularly good time to, to see that benefit if it's there. Um, so in terms of which products should you use, um, which products should you use on a protected urea side? Look, I know there's an issue there around supply and getting your hands on it. That's, a, that's kind of an ongoing issue, but um, there are 20 products available from six uh, fertilizer companies, pre-ordering it, it may help. And I'm gonna show you a little example now, which will highlight uh, why it might be worth your while going to a bit of extra trouble to try and source it. Um, you know, I, I recognize that for many of you, you're wondering if you can even get fertilizer um, and, and, and that's an issue, that's an issue too. Um, but let's just have a little look at the cost savings by fertilizer nitrogen choice. So if we take uh, this exam these example prices, now maybe you can buy, buy these cheaper or dearer, but regardless, you should be able to plug your values into this calculation and make that calculation. So let's say with can at 700 a ton, protected urea at 970 and urea at 920. How much nitrogen are you actually getting in that ton of fertilizer? So at 46%, so just add a zero onto these percentages and you have the kilograms of N in a ton. So for can you're down at 270 and with the ureas you're up at 460. And if you divide this value into the price, you'll have a cost per kilogram in and you can compare them on the same basis. And you can see there, even though protected urea sounds more, sounds expensive. And, you know, you do hear people saying that it's not being stocked because it's, it's too expensive. Um, it's actually cheaper than can by almost 50 cents, which it would be an enormous um, amount in other years. And if you consider the potential for a rate saving, it's actually better value than, than standard urea. And I'm supposed to look at this in another way. For that 460 kilograms of N that you can get in a ton of a urea product, how much would you have to pay for that if you were to, to purchase that same amount of nitrogen using can, which would be in a different tonnage amount, but the same amount of nitrogen, you'd be heading for, for 1200 euros um, a ton. And if you scale that up to, let's say 100 kilograms per hectare of straight nitrogen that could be inserted in a 40 hectare farm, um, that's almost a 2,000 euro uh, difference or saving potentially there that could be made by using protected urea uh, versus, versus canned product, even though the can appears cheaper, cheaper per ton. And look, of course, all this will depend on what fertilizer prices do and how they change. That's why it's important to be able to do this calculation up here yourself and assess what's the best value. So look, at, thanks for your attention and bearing with me. Um, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to do my best to, to address them. Thanks, Patrick. Um, you, you've really shown the, 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 the deep knowledge that's there uh, in, in Johnstown Castle with uh, the, the whole soil and nutrient interaction there. And I just wanted to bring people's attention. Maybe, Patrick, you could just stop sharing your screen for a moment there. And I just want to share and give you a little break <laughs> as well um, to, to just to share um, some of the uh, details of the soil, nutrient and fertilizer fact sheets that are available. And this is probably a good first step for people to, to go and look uh, for advice around uh, soil and, and uh, soil fertility and best practice around fertilizer use um, and to... To, to look at all of the different uh, aspects of fertilizer planning, I uh, highly recommend this uh, section on the Chagas website. Uh, and you can also look at the Chagas YouTube channel. There's lots of information there about reseeding. And there was a number of webinars done in last year that really gave good, good advice to people. And of course, uh, the, uh, good advice as well as to talk to your, your Chagas advisor uh, to, to, to see, you know, to get that ad ad advice. And I know Chagas are planning a number of events throughout the year 
uh, to uh, do demonstrations on clover and clover management because it, there is a, a management piece there that I think people need to, to be aware of before embarking on clover. Um, so, uh, Patrick, a lot of questions, huge interest in this topic, obviously, because of uh, fertilizer prices are, are uh, putting a lot of uh, um, focus on people's minds and how, how, how to, to actually address the issue. But just a, a couple of questions there for, I had there. You, you mentioned about testing your slurry. What's, uh, how, how does one go about that, doing that? And, and uh, where, where, where can I go to get my slurry tested? Yeah, that, that, that's a good question. So it's the, the practicalities of doing it, look, the, the laboratories in, in, in the country, and um, most of them are, are doing slurry testing. So I suppose that's a, that's a matter of contacting your, 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 your local um, lab or the lab that you'd often use. So I, I suppose I don't want to start naming, naming mm -hmm. off labs, but there's a whole, there, there's a, a range of them around Ireland that do soil testing and that also do slurry testing. So if you can get your soils tested, you can also get your slurry tested. And um, I suppose look at for taking a slurry sample, um, you know, uh, your health and safety is the very first uh, thing that you need to be conscious of. Um, you don't want to be taking any risks um, with, with slurry, but um, you know, ideally you want to, uh, um, like you, you do want an agitated sample that's been, um, you know, that's been well, well mixed up and you, the lab will advise you on what quantity uh, that they need. You know, it may be a liter, maybe less, it may be, maybe a little bit more that, that they require um, to get that um, analysis done. Um, I suppose, like thinking about it in practical terms, um, you know, if you're agitating a tank and going off and spreading your silage ground, um, there is a potential there. You have an agitated tank, you've, you've drawn the story up into the tanker, Maybe you have a gate valve on the tanker that you can safely access and take a sample from. Once it's gotten into the tank a little bit, you're keeping a good um, calibration on, on how what rate of slurry you're applying. So you have that information. Did you apply 2,000 gallons, 3,000 gallons? Where are you at on that? You send off your sample and you get the information back. And then you've got your rate of slurry that you applied. You've got a label for your slurry that you can sit down with your advisor um, and you know what's gone on and you can then match up the yeah. fertilizer, mineral fertilizer requirement uh, and trying to be um, closer to, to, to what it needs to be. And I think that's particularly worthwhile um, given the high fertilizer prices. And it, it's an opportunity that's there. I think that's right for the picking. And I know it's a, a bit of extra work. It is a bit of extra work, but I suppose if we want to get these gains, there's usually a bit of extra management there to, to be done. Um, but I, I suppose if you, if you don't feel that you can do that, going to the book values that are there and looking at those resources that are there um, on, on, the, on the Chagas website and indeed in that article that I mentioned in today's farm, um, drawing on that information that, that William Burchill did as part of that survey of the joint program farms, looking at the concentration of nutrients in different stories, story stores will help to get you closer than you might if you're if you're using no information. So you can you can access a copy of the today's an online version of today's farm on the Chagas website as well. And just finally, uh, from from my own perspective, you 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 mentioned lime quite a bit. Uh, I know from my days working and as an advisor in in, in Galway that uh, the interaction with peat soils uh, can can uh, give you mixed results. What, what's your advice around that or just a, a bit of care needed really I imagine when when using lime in, in peat type soils yeah the, 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 there is care uh, there needed and I mentioned mineral soils quite 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 a bit and um, for those values in the pH 6 range um, but for the mineral soils there's a lower optimal target so you do need to be careful um, and that's where going to your soil test and your soil test being informed that it's a peat soil will give you the guidance that you need in terms of rates that will be appropriate uh, for those peat soils um, with, with lime. And I suppose just on the lime point, I suppose you might be thinking, God, if I apply lime now, it's not going to give me that uh, increase in pH. It's going to take some time for that to happen. Like all lime that's sold in Ireland has to meet at least a third of it being at a very fine level, which will be immediately available and reactive. So if you purchase lime, a ton of lime, at least 333 kilograms of that will be readily activated, active, activated um, 
into the soil for um, increasing the pH. Um, often, often it's more, um, but in any case, it'll feed out over a number of years as well. So lime is giving you that quick rise, but it's also giving you um, a, a longevity to it as a very good value, the ground limestone. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> thanks, thanks, Patrick. Uh, Pat, a lot of questions coming in, uh, particularly around that that interaction between slurry and lime as well. Yeah, and and uh, a couple of, of uh, our more scientific people are, are asking questions about the, the uh, um, I suppose, the science behind correcting pH and the reduction of, of nitrous oxide. What's the what's the impact? How does that happen? Yeah, no, it, it, it's a good question. So in this particular study, um, the having a, a higher level of pH um, was bringing higher nitrogen use efficiency or recovery of the fertilizer nitrogen by the plant. And I think this is at least in part uh, the mechanism for a reduced nitrous, nitrous oxide emissions just because the plant is taking up that nitrogen more efficiently. But th there is um, ongoing scientific work there um, that's that's looking at and some of it showing that higher pHs can be associated with um, lower emissions of nitrous oxide emissions. So there may be also a pH effect on just how the bacteria that are that are driving that denitrification uh, process that's producing nitrous oxide or indeed um, the nitrous oxide that's generated through nitrification of ammonia. Um, may be influenced um, by, by the pH, but look at it, it's an ongoing area of research. Okay, quick question, uh, uh, can versus urea, is there any difference in production response for each product at different pH levels? Um, I think you broke up a bit there, Pat, but the, the, the question I think was, is there is there a difference in response um, for, um, let's say that can versus urea or protected urea comparison at different pH levels. And look at, I suppose over the last number of years, uh, over the last, I don't know, I'm starting to lose track now, just eight or nine years at this stage, probably we, we've done many experiments across many different soils and many different pH levels. And um, I, I would say generally in the, in the acidic range, so less than pH seven, um, and we see uh, similar uh, similar performance um, between the fertilizers um, across a, a range of those um, soil pHs, um, and I'd say like in the long term trial as well, um, the, the the pH um, of that trial has been falling over time, and I'm deliberately letting it fall because I want to see if there's any divergence in pH between the um, the nutrient sources. But we we see this that that same sort of a trend um, of, of a, a benefit, a, a yield increase or a benefit um, for um, can versus protected urea across a, a, a gradient of pH. Uh, there's a, a couple of questions that have come in in relation to the, the potential use of, of uh, liquid fertilizers and, and where it fits in terms of efficacy and, and losses. Yeah, no, it, it's a good question. Um, so while I work a lot with granular fertilizers now, because I guess the, in, in Ireland, uh, that, that's the main portion of the market currently, at least. Um, before, I, before I came home, I worked for five or six years in North America and where I was, it was all liquid, uh, all liquid nitrogen. So um, I've worked quite a, a lot with it. I suppose what I will say is if you're set up for liquid and you do have to be set up for it, obviously like you have to be set up for anything really, um, it, it can be it can be a good option and it does bring uh, certain flexibilities. I suppose there's a few things to be aware of when you're looking at liquid products and um, they may not all be the same. Let's say if you've got UAN, what are you dealing with now? So you're dealing with a product that's, it, it's uh, half of it is like can, if you like, it's ammonium nitrate and half of it is urea. And that urea portion of it um, can be susceptible to ammonia volatilization loss um, and how you apply that product is going to have a, an implication in terms of um, its potential for losing some of that urea nitrogen as um, ammonia. So for instance, if you if you spray it onto the leaf versus if you uh, apply it with a stream or nozzle where it falls to the ground and has soil contact and is more, let's say, in a concentrated uh, band that, that engages and goes into the soil. Um, 
Also, there's opportunity there for using a urease inhibitor with it. Um, and uh, when I was in North America, that was pretty standard for farmers to add a urease inhibitor themselves um, to the UAN fertilizer. You know, that may not be the way that we want to do it here in Ireland, but um, that did happen there. Um, if you've got a, a, a urea only product, which is, uh, which is dissolved urea, and then you've got all urea, so you need to be conscious of that potential for ammonia loss. Um, there's also products that have acidified, um, that, that the urea is dissolved, but it's acidified, and that has potential to mitigate um, loss of ammonia from, from those, um, those products. So the liquids, they're not all the same. They're not applied in the same way. So you kind of need to hone in on which one are you talking about and how are you doing it? So there's potential to do it very well, I would say, and also potential to maybe be having some having we're, some we're, levels we're of getting a, we're getting tight on time, but there is an important question there around protected urea. As uh, is, is there any need for protected urea in February or March in wet or damp conditions? Is there is there a benefit in using it? Yeah. Okay. So the the questions around loss uh, for protected urea. Mm. Um. So if the conditions are wet and damp. Um, and dull, you'll typically have lower levels of ammonia loss from a urea fertilizer. Um, and if those are the conditions that you're applying in, the let's say the, the benefit of that insurance of the protection is going to be less because the urea has less loss. But if you remember at the beginning of February, we had lovely bright days. And, uh, and as I drove around Cork, actually, in, in, in February, everywhere you went, you, you could smell um, the slurry. And when you can get that smell um, of, of the slurry, you also have conditions that are favorable to ammonia loss. So that was in February. You have, um, even though it's cooler, you have conditions that are you know, windy and bright, and they favor loss. And, it, and if that ends up being the February day that you apply in, protected urea is going to give you uh, more benefit. From the inventory perspective, Every ton of urea that we use or spread counts against us on the on the ammonia emissions front, and 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 we were exceeding our target here. And we need to get under it. So um, the protected urea is bringing a benefit there as well, and there's a potential to cut its rate um, by about twelve percent versus the the standard urea. And obviously that's going to change based on the weather con conditions. Exactly what will happen in a given field, but. On a, on a broader average. And I suppose this is where your management comes in as an important factor in saving money this year and every year. Okay, we are up to half past 10. And I, I know there are other questions we didn't get to today, uh, but maybe we, we just think about how we will address those. I uh, have a lo huge amount of interest in, in today's topic. So Patrick, thank you so much for your time and the really excellent presentation. I really like those, the tips, you know, that in each slide, it's, it's, it's very practical advice. And of course, people can look back on the presentation. I know there were some few technical aspects presented there. You can look back at that. We'll have that up on the, the Chagas YouTube channel over the next few days. Um, just uh, to let you know, next week, we'll be speaking to Carol Kish from the Mulcair project uh, on on-farm actions to improve water quality on the Mulcair catchment, which is down in County Limerick. Uh, so uh, do join us for that next next Friday. Um, but also I want to draw your attention to uh, an event, a series of events that are happening next week as part of the Agricultural Catchments Program. And they're showcasing measures to improve Ireland's water quality. And we'll, the week will include a broad range of topics, including uh, work being done by the, the Catchments Program for the last number of years and some of the uh, organizations it has worked with since 2008. And it will also feature research advisory and technical work that the program continues to deliver in partnership with catchment farmers. So uh, do look on the, the Chagas website. There's lots of uh, different activities happening there uh, around that, that really important project that's uh, supporting uh, Ireland's uh, nitrates regulations. Uh, so a lot of, lot, of, uh, lot of information gathered by the project there over the last number of years. So we're going to play you out with a... Uh, short video clip uh, that uh, promotes this week and again my thanks to, to Patrick and Pat for helping with questions and I want to thank our uh, backroom team Yvonne Maher for work uh, helping out with the technical side today and uh, our series producer Andy Boland and to all our partners so we will see you next week 
and uh, do stay safe. Uh, hopefully the wind isn't blowing too hard wherever you are this morning. Okay, thanks very much.